meetings like this, we learn so much from our colleagues in other fields. Um, but since I don't really get to see everybody and know at what level they are, I'm going to do some basic things on biomechanics. So we're doing a human function on a very macro level rather than a molecular level, because it has a tremendous effect in terms of how we treat every form of arthritis, and even more fundamentally, how we assess which types, what kinds of arthritis we need to treat in which ways, and what constitutes a good result. My title is Biomechanics of the Foot and Ankle, Why They Matter and How They Do. Those are my titles. And I have spent more than two decades uh, looking at patients, um, doing basically basic science research on human beings by measuring their function non-invasively in the gait lab, because I felt we needed objective outcomes outcome measures for reconstructive surgeries that were real time, in vivo, reproducible, objective measures of biomechanical function. What we orthopedic surgeons do is try to make people feel better and function better. And there are basically three reasons why an orthopedic foot and ankle doctor is gonna see, or any orthopedic surgeon is gonna see a patient, and that's gonna be because they have pain, because they have trouble with motion, uh, that is to say, ambulation and activity, the things they do in everyday life, or because they have some terrible deformity or some combination thereof. Now, this is how I got interested in gait analysis. This is our lab at Baylor with motion cameras that create three-dimensional pictures, uh, force plates here on the floor. And this is the same technology that's used now um, to make sports uh, video games. It started as a medical technology and now you can get animated movies with uh, green ogres like Shrek, all done in the same way in which we make three dimensional models of human beings working and then you can put it on um, a cartoon. Now, I, I wanna give you an interesting story of how gait analysis actually started. So there's this fellow named Leland Stanford he was an entrepreneur, a tycoon, an industrialist. He was very involved in the first transcontinental railroad. He became governor of California and he was a US Senator. And he also really, really liked horses. And he had a farm where he kept them in this little town in California called Palo Alto. And uh, he later on, somebody else took that farm and did other things with it. There's some university there whose name escapes me, but, um, it perhaps named after him, and he had a bet that when the horse is galloping, there is a point at which all four of the horse's feet are off the ground, but nobody could really prove it. So he hired this very peculiar fellow named Edward Moybridge, who was an Englishman. And he worked off and on for Leland Stanford for a uh, a decade and a half to answer this question of horses. He was a colorful character uh, who shot uh, his wife's lover and did not uh, deny it, but managed not to go to jail or get hanged. Um, and he basically is the person whose techniques, because he was a photographer, were the beginning of gait analysis and fundamentally of all motion pictures of every kind. And what Moybridge did was he set up a series of cameras. You can imagine how cumbersome it was because they were on glass plates, like Matthew Brady in the Civil War. Each camera tripped by a string that the horse would hit as the horse was galloping. And he created these series of pictures that in the beginning were flip books. You've seen flip books where the successive still photographs give you the sensation of motion. And based on this, he was able to prove that yes, indeed, there was a time in the, the galloping horse, you can see it in the third frame top, top row, where all four of the horse's feet were off the ground. Now, in the century before uh, the birth of Jesus, uh, in the uh, uh, Holy Land, 
uh, there were these two famous rabbis, one was called Hillel and one was called Shammai. And a, um, a Gentile came and said, I want you to teach me everything about the learning called the Torah while I'm standing on one foot. And Hillel, who's the famous one now, and was the, you know, the model and teacher from whom Jesus took much of what he said, put it in one sentence. He says, that which is hateful to your neighbor, to you, do not do to your neighbor. Now go study all the rest. Shammai, on the other hand, said, you impudent son of a gun, and he hit him with a two by four, because you can't know everything there is to know while standing on one foot. On the other hand, I will point out to you that 40% of the time when you're moving, you spend your life on one foot, unless you're running like the horse. And the question is, how do we do that? That every single human being can spend 40% of their time. The gait cycle means that your two legs work opposite but reciprocally. 60% of the time, your foot and leg are in contact with the ground. And 40% of the time, you're swinging that contralateral limb forward to take the next step, and that is when it's off the ground. And we categorize the three stages of when someone is walking according to stance and swing phases. And there's a small period of time in which both limbs are on the ground and no time when both limbs are off unless you're running. The three, and I need to go over some basic terms because we're from different disciplines. We basically say simple things. There are three stages in the part of gait when your foot is in contact with the ground. The first is when your heel hits, that's called first rocker. The second is when your foot is flat, that second. And the third is as you begin to push off, and you use the power to propel yourself forward on the front of your foot. Obviously, they are reciprocal and symmetrical, okay, except when someone's uh, not walking normally. Now, I want to, I'm going to pause this video for just a second. And I want to show you pictures of people moving. These are things that you would see if you're a clinician, or if even you're a, a researcher who wants to understand why people have problems from arthritis, which is primarily their mechanical walking and moving functions. And just get used to looking at these pictures as we get into more and more complicated cases. This is a lady with an Achilles tendon rupture. And I want you to see what happens. Notice on her right foot, right. she never pushes off. I'll show you again. Okay, go ahead. On her right foot, it stays flat and she never pushes off. Now, wait, come back toward me for a second. And you can see that her right leg is skinnier than her left because her Achilles isn't working. All right. This is her x-ray showing the indentation of her chronic Achilles rupture. And this is her uh, photograph clinically. Now, the next patient has rheumatoid arthritis and she complains of pain and stiffness in her ankle. The reason we need to understand the biomechanics is she has nothing wrong with her ankle. And I want to watch you, have you watch her walk. I didn't she say she had nothing wrong. She has nothing wrong with her ankle. And what I want you to back. see as she is walking is how her foot on the right turns out. This is the radiograph of her ankle. Her ankle looks fine. So what's the explanation? She has very severe arthritis of the adjacent tail and the vicular joint. And it's common to mistake symptoms in one joint for the other because they're only two and a half or three centimeters away in a small person like her. This is not the ankle, but in, clinical, in layman's terms, the patient will complain of ankle pain. And this is the tail of the joint entirely obliterated, in this case, by rheumatoid arthritis. Now, this is my next dilemma I want you to help me with. Here's a patient with long-term arthritis who say she's doing fantastic. And I will tell you for a fact and prove it to you in a minute that she has absolutely no ankle function whatsoever. And I'd like you to watch her walk.
fast. She's walking pretty fast and she's not having pain and she's smiling at me. And this is what her radiograph looks like on the right. She's had complete fusion of her ankle and all the joints of the back of her foot. And this is a radiograph of her opposite left foot. It is also completely fused. So she has no motion whatsoever. But do you think she was limping? I, I don't. So the question is, what's the relationship mechanically between what makes people with arthritis hurt and gives them functional problems? It's an interesting dilemma. And those are the type of things that I've spent um, a lot of time creating long-term databases with long-term follow-up of patients before and after surgical reconstruction to evaluate what's the nature of their mechanical abnormalities and function and how do we make it better or not. And these are some of the studies that I've published looking at how patients function before and after ankle replacements or ankle fusions and other reconstructions. Now, here's another example of the dilemma that we face mechanically. Here is a patient who has very nice ankle motion. Let me show it to you. Except the patient has no ankle motion. This patient has an entirely fused ankle. And this is the patient's radiograph. The patient's had a long-standing ankle fusion. Well, what was that we just saw? What we saw was what the patient called their ankle is really the joints in the back of the foot. And this is the patient's radiograph standing up, <coughs> leaning forward. And this is the patient leaning back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. So you see in my new bridge type of uh, still image that the patient simulates ankle motion by the motion of the joints around the ankle. And so the question is, well, wow, how does that happen? And what does it mean? So because we're of different subspecialties, I wanna mention some basic terms for definitions that, so we're all on the same page and they are about anatomy, deformity and movement. And in foot anatomy, we're, we're very simple orthopedists. We have the back, the middle and the front. And those are defined not by the bones, but by the joints. Here you see at the uh, far right, the ankle is this joint and only this joint. It's the joint between the leg and the foot, the tibio tailor joint. And you can see by the curve, it only goes up and down. But people call their ankle what goes side to side. Those are the hind foot joints here in the back. The forefoot joints are easy. That's the joints at the bases of the toes and the toes themselves. And the midfoot is what's left in between. So the forefoot joints are the MTP joints and toes and the hindfoot joints, subtalar, tail and navicular, calcaneal cuboid, and the midfoot joints, which move, move the least, but can be most affected of any, well, routinely most affected any other joints in the foot and ankle by osteoarthritis are the midfoot joints. It's an interesting question why, since they don't move very much. And we need research to look into this and the kind of questions I'm trying to show you. Now, the next definition has to do with deformity. And um, just to be sure to those who are not orthopedic surgeons, um, just review that we have these two really important words called varus and valgus. And varus and valgus are terms that mean which way does it point relative to the midline of the body or the limb. If it points toward the midline, it's in and called varus. If it points out from the midline, it's valgus. And now it gets more complicated in the foot and ankle because the foot and ankle has motion in all three planes. Varus is in, which we also call on the back of the foot inversion, but it's also called supination and the way you remember it in your hand. So this is supination, palm up, and this is pronation, palm down. And you can think about that in terms of the position of the heel as the deformities occur. In this patient, the foot is angled or the ankle is angled inward away 
inward toward the midline of the body. So that's varus. And this is a patient with a valgus ankle deformity because it goes away from the midline of the body. Now here's a patient whose ankles and feet point downward and also on the left particularly are twisted inward and that's equinus and varus. The pathology and the function of the patient and whether they need treatment and what treatment they need is not a function just purely of synovitis or joint degeneration or joint damage. In the foot and ankle, just like in a burned out rheumatoid, some of the symptoms are distinct to the deformity and the alteration of function. People who have something crooked in the back of the foot may present to the rheumatologist or the orthopedist with pain in the front of the foot. So the mechanics are incredibly important and actually kind of complicated. Now, here's a point that I have to tell you, and it's going to require review, and this is just a survey talk. But if the front, but the point is this, the front and back of your feet move in reciprocal fashion when there is deformity. So imagine your heel is turned inward, your right heel. And I want you to put your foot on the floor and kind of turn your foot inward. That is to say, lift up where you're sort of putting your sole pointing up away from the floor, right? At this point, you've supinated your foot, right? If the front of your foot and the back of your foot both rolled the same way, you'd be walking on the outside of your foot, right? If you had, quote, pronation, which is supposed to be a horrible disease if you're a runner, but it's one of the normal things, you would point your foot out the other way. Now you do it again with yourself on your foot on the floor where your pinky comes off the floor. Now your foot is pronated. If your entire foot is pronated, then the whole outside border of your foot's off the ground and you can't really walk on it. We get some of both. But most of the time, one part of the foot goes one way and one part of the foot goes the other in order to get the foot flat on the ground. It's very important. And I'm gonna teach you one thing about it very quickly. I'd like you to stand up because I know it's a Zoom call, but I want you to stand up, including the people whose pictures I can see. And I want you to put, take your shoe off or just put your foot flat on the ground in the shoe. And what I want you to do is to keep your feet as if they're glued onto the floor. And I want you to twist around to your right and see what happens to your foot. The inside side of your foot lifts off the ground, correct? And when you twist back, your foot comes flat on the ground. And when you twist to the left, the inside of your left foot comes off the ground. Now, what that means is, is that there's this incredible mechanism to change the torque by rotating your hips and turning your tibia, your, your whole foot turns to accommodate it, right? I just showed it, you just proved it to you on you. There's a relationship then, not just between the front and back of the foot, but between the motion of the tibia and the body above it and the position of the foot and vice versa. If you're walking on a sloped ground, if you're trying to go down a ramp, if you're in an uneven field at your child's soccer game, anytime you're on uneven ground, the two places where you're able to do the turning and change the plane of function, it's your hip, which is a ball joint, and the back of your foot. And this is very important for how patients present to us with rheumatoid or osteoarthritis or arthritis of any kind. And the way it works is that those back of the foot joints are an amazing mechanism to make the foot both flexible and rigid. And I'll skip some of the mechanics because we don't have very much time, but in each part of the foot, including in the front, the biomechanics are essential to understanding why the patient has pain in that place in that way, 
and how we treat them. For example, in the front of the foot, the toes function primarily passively. You don't really use your toe muscles to push off as much as your toes move and tighten by the forward momentum of your body over the front of your foot as you go forward. And that's why people have very good results from fusing their big toes because they don't need the power, they need a stable lever to push off. Here's a man who's 35, he has pain and weakness. He's not got arthritis at all, but he demonstrates what would happen if you had arthritis in the same back of the foot joints. Here he stands with pretty flat feet, worse on the right than the left. And you can see a bulge more on the right, just below his ankle. Okay. Go up on and when he goes up on his heels like this, you see he looks pretty good on both sides, but he's also holding on to the bench. Okay, now go up on that one. When he goes up on his good. Come down. And go up. All right. When he goes up on this side, notice he can't really turn his foot in all the way, and he can't go up all the way. Okay, now go up on that one. Come down. But here, he's even worse. And on this side, he cannot go up at all. Why? Because his hind foot joints are not working. The joints at the back of the foot below the ankle. Unless his hind foot can rotate inward to become rigid, as I just showed you, yours is flexible when you twist it standing up, then the entire power of the back of his leg cannot be transferred into the foot and allow him to push up off his toes. So if you have arthritis in the hind foot joints, you're disabled from the ability to, to, to use your foot. So in this patient, I'm just gonna show you again, this is the ankle and this is the hind foot. If you had to choose between losing your hind foot function and your ankle function, you'd probably rather lose your ankle function because your hind foot is so critical to so many functions of everyday life. Now, we have, I have a few minutes and I'm gonna show you a very complicated case of a patient with arthritis in which deformity in one area then produced fracture and deformity in, the, in all kinds of other places. And then I'll quickly just show you a bit of some of my data out of the lab because it's a topic that could take you know, much longer to really give you the idea of what we do. Here's a lady who has rheumatoid and osteopenia who had rheumatoid rupture of her posterior tibial tendon and made her hind foot very collapsed. The collapse of her hind foot caused her foot to turn outward in valgus. And as it turned outward, it pushed on her fibula and it pushed so hard because it was so crooked, she broke her fibula, just a stress fracture and this has been broken for a year. And then her foot was so turned, or as I told you, pronated, that the front of her foot had to then supinate or move the opposite way. So she comes in with a stress fracture in the front of the foot, because the back has gone so far this way that the front has got to move the opposite way in order to get her foot on the ground. And because she's got osteoporosis and she's very little, it, the bone just broke to accommodate the deformity. If we don't understand the mechanics of that, we can't really treat her. And this is something that the, is fundamental to understanding the reconstructive uh, strategies for foot and ankle. And this is what she looks like. Now, the last little thing I'm gonna show you is a study that we did looking at what uh, patient reported outcomes with physical function, where we measured the actual function the people in the laboratory walking. And that's because we want to be patient-centered and we want to use what the patients think about their arthritis as and their surgical treatment or non-surgical treatment as the way that we measure, did they get better? But there are many confounding factors clinically. If the patient has a great result from the surgical reconstruction of their ankle or foot, but their knee arthritis is bad on the opposite side, or their hip is a problem, 
then the patient reported outcomes, which ask generalized function questions, even though they're validated subjective instruments, completely obscure the result. So these are looking at the kinds of data that we look at out of our gate lab, where we measure how fast people walk, how much motion they have in their joints, and how much power they have when they walk. And what we saw when we looked at the patient reported outcomes and did a multivariate regression analysis of the various parameters of their objective function was that the scores corresponded to the power in their walk, they corresponded to the speed of their walking, and they had no correlation to how much their joints move at the ankle. And that was true for multiple universally used, validated, patient-reported outcome measures. The SF36 is one. No correlation with range of motion. No correlation with a visual analog pain scale before or after surgical intervention. So what that study showed us was something that's never been shown before, which was that our patient reported outcomes correspond with speed, power, and not with range of motion. What does that mean? It means it explains perhaps in an oblique way, or at least opens the door to understand why we get such good results from joint fusions. And it teaches us at least with some introductory data, and I've got a lot of data, that it's not stiffness that gives people their symptoms as much as pain. And that when we have patients with stiffened joints, if they're very stiff with a fusion, they don't hurt. If they're a lot stiff and move just enough for the osteoarthritis to create a little wiggle, even just a little, then their pain inhibits their function in multiply objective measurable parameters of gait. So it leads us to far more questions than answers, which is, is it better to fuse an ankle? Is it better to replace an ankle? And the debate continues. Well, the answer is they're both really good. And their similarities are far greater than their differences. And we've proved this in the lab. But what we also showed was that our treatment, neither of our treatments surgically is as good as normal. And there is diminished from normal in about the same amount. So thank you very much. I think my time is up, Charlie.